ponder is not a very common English word, nor a very common American habit. It may be easier to define than to do. Merriam-Webster says that to ponder is to weigh in the mind, to appraise, to think about, to reflect on, and as an intransitive verb, to think or consider especially quietly, soberly, and deeply. I like those last few words, quietly, soberly, and deeply. Have you thought about anything quietly, soberly, and deeply lately? Maybe it's because of Harvey or the holiday, but those times have been few and far between for me lately. I do like the root of the word, though. The Oxford English Dictionary says that it was used in Middle English to mean appraising something, judging the words of something. Before that, it was an old French word, pondere. And even further back, it was a Latin word, ponderare, which meant to weigh or to reflect on, and which ultimately had its origin in the Latin word pondus, which means weight. So to ponder, Merriam-Webster says, implies a careful weighing of a problem. I would add that to ponder is to feel the weight or the significance of a thing or of a train of thought or of a series of events. So it's a great word, but it's only used once in the English New Testament in this text that's the key to the song you just heard. It's in Luke 2.19, but Mary treasured up all these things pondering them in her heart. And the Greek word that's translated pondering is symbolo, which has a completely different origin than the Latin word. It literally means to throw together, and it's translated by a variety of things, including combine, confer, encounter, and meet with. But the translators of the King James Bible looking at the fact that Mary threw together these things in her heart and considered them or treasured them in her thoughts, decided to use the strong, wonderful word ponder in their translation. And other translators of the English Bible have agreed and kept the word. And I agree too, although I'd like to offer the word meditate as an equally reasonable translation as seen in the Holman Christian Standard Version. She meditated on these things, where to meditate implies a definite focusing of one's thoughts on something so as to store it around and understand it deeply. We associate the word meditate more with our engagement of Scripture than we do the word ponder, though both are good. But it's the personal engagement in the Word of God that David and Hannah have highlighted in Mary's ponderings. We'll see as we walk through their text and the corresponding episodes in Luke that we too should ponder or meditate on the mysteries of the Son's advent as written in God's Word. So what are these things that Mary pondered? David has poetically captured them in the song, and they reflect the words of chapters 1 and 2 at Luke. And because the chapters are long and the verses of the song are short, we'll use the song as our guide, but we'll focus on seeing how God revealed the truths about Jesus the Son. So Hannah begins this way. Words of an angel announcing joyfully So these are things happening to Mary, and David has cast Mary's point of view into the song. But the song isn't about Mary. It's about Jesus. It's about the wonder of his incarnation revealed to Mary and through her to us in the recorded words of angels, prophets, and even of Jesus himself. So another way of looking at the big idea of the song, which we'll see at the end, is that if you want to know Jesus, deeply hear the words that were spoken about him and by him. 
So the first verse then reflects the words of Luke 1, 26 to 38. The angel Gabriel comes to Mary in Nazareth. He greets her as highly favored, the recipient of much blessing from God. Now the familiar Catholic prayer says, Hail Mary, full of grace. But I don't think that quite captures it. Though the Greek word is the word used for grace, the verb form clearly implies that Mary isn't the possessor of some inherent grace. She is the recipient of great grace and favor from God. Hannah goes on to sing that Mary is to be God's handmaid. And there they're looking at the end of the passage where Mary says, Behold, I am the servant or the handmaiden of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. But the word spoken to Mary in between, here and everywhere else in this narrative, tend to focus on Jesus. Luke one thirty one, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. We don't know exactly what Mary pondered or meditated on in the time spanned by these passages, but there's enough here to fill up months of quiet, sober, and deep thinking. You, the angel says, you're a virgin, but you're going to have a son. You'll call him Jesus, the common Greek spelling of the Hebrew name Yeshua or Joshua, but has an awesome meaning. Jehovah saves. When Mary is betrothed, Joseph gets the same message. The angel says, he, Jesus, will save his people from their sins. He will be so great that he will be seen as the Son of the Most High. And in the Gospels, Jesus is often seen this way and accused of claiming to be the Son of God. The people of Israel in Jesus' day, from the demons to the common folk to the rulers, recognized that to be the Son of God was to be equal with God. It was a claim to deity. And he will also be the Messiah. That word, Christ, isn't used here in Luke, but every Jew would recognize that it was the promised Messiah who would reign on David's throne and over the house of Jacob forever. Mary, naturally enough, asks, how can that happen? I'm a virgin. Verse 35, and the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. The last phrases in the first verse of the song reflect this. This child is not conceived by a human father, but by God himself, God the Holy Spirit. That's why this child is the Son of the Most High. He's the Son of God and the Son of Man, the Son of Mary, both fully human and the Son of God, fully divine. Verse 36. Mary is told that her cousin Elizabeth is also pregnant. Elizabeth, who was barren, has been given a miracle from God and a son who would be the herald of the Messiah, John the Baptist. So in verse 39, Mary goes to Judea to visit Elizabeth. Words of my cousin celebrating life, even my shalom is used by God. So when Mary arrives, she greets her cousin, probably with the traditional Jewish greeting, shalom, or peace. 
And then, verse 41, when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy, and blessed is she who has believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. So Elizabeth's words celebrate this baby that is growing in her cousin's womb. God the Holy Spirit gives her insight so that she confirms that this, that by this pregnancy, Mary was fulfilling the word of the Lord and becoming the mother of my Lord. Now, the Catholic Church has taken this statement and a few others like it and elevated Mary to an exalted and even sinless state as the mother of God. The Protestant Church, in response, has often downplayed Mary's role. But in a purely factual sense, she is the mother of my Lord. She gave birth to the incarnate Son of God. This doesn't mean she was sinless or that she herself didn't need a Savior, but it does mean, as the Scripture says, that she was uniquely blessed by God and used by Him. So this statement of Elizabeth's is followed by Mary's famous song, often called the Magnificat, because in it, she magnifies the Lord for his blessing given to her, but also to the whole world. Now, the song that David wrote doesn't really go into that, but it seems to imply that that we should look on the Magnificat as one of those times when Mary treasured and kept these things in her heart and pondered out loud, in this case, the mysteries of the Lord. The next verse covers a lot of territory. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. David summarizes all that with words of my husband asking for a place to welcome this miracle bearing heaven's face. The song doesn't go into the pain of her labor or the miracle of the birth, but Mary does ponder the irony that the one whose birth is miraculous, who comes from heaven, can find no place on earth. As Jesus would later say, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. The Apostle John says he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But the lowly and the distant did welcome him. Words of wealthy strangers with stories of a star. The Gospel of Matthew records the visit of these magi, these wise men, who came asking, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. It's almost like these magi overheard the words of the angel Gabriel that the Lord God would give to him the throne of his father David. How the magi knew this truth from afar is a matter of speculation. But to Mary, as she thought quietly, soberly, and deeply about the events of her son's birth, these words must have brought a profound wonder. A silly innkeeper didn't recognize the arrival of his people's Messiah, but those who looked from afar dropped everything to come and welcome and worship him. The distant 
and the lowly received these words. We know the story of the shepherds. We're going to go into a bit of detail next week in David's song, Shepherd's Call. But the point David and Hannah make here is that these lowly shepherds brought him worship from the heart. They had a good example, of course, the worship of the angels that they had seen glorifying God in the highest. At the end of Luke's account, we read that the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Why did they worship? Because they had been told good news of great joy of a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now, don't miss the growing emphasis on words here, on what had been told them. God has this wonderful habit of explaining events with words. When he sends the rainbow, he tells them what it's a sign of. When he rescues some people from Egypt, he gives them reasons and implications over and over again. When he gives the tabernacle, he explains what each component and each offering signifies. And when he sends Jesus, he explains who he is and why he's coming. I mean, a baby in the stable, in a stable is ordinary, maybe it's somewhat tragic, but when you are told who he is, it becomes significant. In the same way, When God raises Jesus from death, it's not just a bare miracle. It's a miracle with a message of sacrifice and redemption and victory and life. God never does something in Scripture without explaining it in terms of his character, his plan, and his promises. This is one of the reasons we cling to the word because words are a bit harder to misinterpret than bare events would have been. So one of the things implied here in choosing the the distant and the lowly to welcome Jesus is that through Jesus, God will now welcome the distant and the lowly even today. Jesus began his ministry by quoting Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus came for the lowly and the oppressed and the distant. Jesus says, many will come from east and west and sit at the table in the kingdom of God. He says, I have other sheep that are not of this fold, not of Israel. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. So that's us. We're the other sheep. We're the distant. We're the lowly who Jesus came to save. And as we put our trust in him, as we put our faith in him, he rescues us from our sin and makes us a part of his redemptive work. So it's at this point in Luke's narrative that he records the big idea of David and Hannah's song, verse 19, but Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. But the song also shows us that she didn't stop pondering as events continued to unfold. The fourth verse of the song says thus. prophet and the lady mentioned in this verse are Simeon and Anna, also from Luke chapter 2. After the birth of Jesus, Joseph and Mary waited the required seven days and then brought the baby Jesus to the temple to present him to the Lord, as outlined in Leviticus chapter 12. Verse 25, now there was a man in Jerusalem 
His name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. Mary's pondering is brought back again to God's salvation that he is working through this one that she has just given birth to and now has obediently given the name Jesus. Simeon says, my eyes have seen your Jesus, your salvation. He will be a light for the Gentiles and the glory of God's people, Israel. Just as the wise men reveal God's heart for the distant, so Simeon's words recall God's heart for the Gentiles and for his own people. One of my favorite verses from Isaiah's servant songs says, It is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. That's to us. But Simeon also speaks words that pierce to Mary's soul. Luke 2.34 And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, This child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed and a sword will pierce through your own soul also so that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Simeon gives Mary a lot to ponder that the work of this promised Messiah and King, her son, will not only bring about the rising of many in Israel but also the fall of many and that her son will be a sign that is opposed. And it's in that opposition that a sword will pierce Mary's soul. I don't think she knows at this point that Jesus will achieve our salvation on hers by his sacrificial and brutal death. But Simeon has seen that the road to his kingship will not be unbroken, and he warns Mary to ponder this as well. The words of the lady that all the world should know are the words of Anna, verse 36. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. There's no doubt that Mary thought quietly, soberly, deeply about these things. But Hannah and David end the song by confronting Mary with the words of Jesus himself. Words from my soul that I don't understand Waiting for direction from him true confession. When I made the video last year, which emphasizes, of course, what I saw as the scriptures under the song, I partially missed that this verse was still about Luke 2. When I thought about Jesus waiting to hear the voice of his father, I thought about the time when he told Mary in John chapter 2 that my time has not yet come. And, And that fits, I think, especially in the sense of Mary not understanding it. But it turns out that David was thinking of the end of Luke 2, where Jesus, at age 12, goes with his family to the temple. 
So when the Passover is finished, Mary and Joseph return home, large caravan of travelers, takes them a whole day to figure out that Jesus isn't in the group. Luke 2.45, and when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to him. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. Mary and Joseph have been raising this child for 12 years. Nobody knows how many things to ponder came along during those years. No place in Scripture gives us any other details of Jesus' childhood. But then he goes to the temple, and his questions, his questions cause amazement to the teachers, which is something that kept going on his whole life. His questions caused amazement, and his parents were astonished. Yet they sound so much like every parent. Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. But Jesus is not every child. He says, I must be in my father's house. Maybe he's saying, you remember what the angel said to me at my birth? Said about me at my birth? That I would be called the son of the most high and the son of God? I'm taking ownership of that now. As I approach the Jewish age of accountability, I recognize that my true Father is the one in heaven, that this is his house, and that I have a mission that flows out of my relationship with him. And though Mary didn't understand this, she continued, verse 51, to treasure up all these things in her heart. It doesn't say here that she pondered them. But Luke already said that a little bit back. And this repetition of the first phrase lets us know that the pondering and the treasuring continued, even when Mary didn't understand God's plan or even his words. She didn't give up on thinking quietly, soberly, and deeply. She continued it through all of the life and ministry of Jesus, and even when a sword did pierce her own soul, and she continued it right through the resurrection to the other side. We only hear of Mary once in passing after the resurrection as she joined the apostles in the upper room, Acts 1.14. But we know that Jesus' brothers turned from doubt to faith, and there's no reason to doubt at all that Mary lived out the faith because she had been pondering Jesus' work in her heart this whole long time. So what have we seen? Our big idea and application today are well summarized in the partial verse that concludes this song. These things I have treasured are written in the word. Listen now and ponder the mysteries of the Everything Mary treasured, everything she pondered, everything she thought about quietly, soberly, and deeply, David and Hannah tell us, is written in the Word. The Word that we have. So we have the opportunity this Christmas season and in every season to ponder these truths and a host of other beautiful truths. God has not only acted in the incarnation, he has explained his actions in the world. Word, we celebrate this child because the whole Bible points to him and the titles the angels gave him are true. He is Jesus, the one through whom Yahweh saves. He is the Christ, 
the Messiah whom God sent to rescue, the one who sits on David's throne and reigns forever. He is the Son of the Most High, the Holy Son of God, and he is our Savior, the salvation of Israel and God's light to us, the Gentiles who put our faith in him. All of these things, each of these things, and so many more are worth pondering this season. But the question is, have you set aside any time for pondering? Is there any time between now and 2018 when you get to meditate, to think quietly, soberly, and deeply? And it's hard. For most of us, this is the busiest time of the year. We've got all the responsibilities of Christmas gifts and Christmas decorating and Christmas events piled on the responsibilities and burdens of our regular lives and all the responsibilities and burdens and inconveniences and opportunities that this hurricane seems to have left behind. So let me close first by encouraging you. This is worth it. God's word is always worth it. Thinking about anything quietly and deeply is usually worth it, but when you're thinking about what the God who loves you has done to rescue you, that is definitely worth it. So I encourage you to find a quiet moment in your days or in the weeks between now and Christmas, a moment when you won't fall asleep, one of your better moments, not your worst moment, Find something during that moment to help you ponder these things. The scriptures themselves, or some Christmas devotional, or a really good Christmas song. Anything that you can take hold of to get a little depth, a little pondering into your season. Second, let me close with a little lighthearted guilting. We always sympathize with new moms. Because the loss of sleep, the added responsibilities, the demands of caring for a newborn make it especially hard in that season to accomplish anything else, including deep thought. But folks, Mary, the mom of a newborn, firstborn son, she found time to ponder. So seriously, if Mary could do it, (laughs) 